In the past decade, there have been 12 honor-based murders in Canada. Without sensationalizing this topic, and without further stigmatizing already stigmatized communities, this video attempts to start a dialogue of honor-based violence and provide some culturally appropriate tools for service providers. Well, all civilized people everywhere, uh, and even those who are not what we may consider very high civilization, they have a sense of honor. What brings shame, what brings honor to a society, or who brings a, a, a family or a society or a community a dishonor. And uh, we honor those, we respect those who bring us, uh, uh, who bring us uh, honor. And, those, and then we are ashamed of those, who, whether they are children, whether they are adults, or people who flee from a, a war. They, they, we feel that they, they brought dishonor to the country. And this is so all over the world. It's, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not only peculiar to one particular community. As you know, Canada is a very multicultural society, and that's the greatness of it, but it also presents some challenges. And it is so also in Britain, in France, in Germany, many countries which have people now coming not only from European background, but also from Asian or African background. So their notion of honor, what is respectable, or who feel that I will be, I will be somehow lowered in the eyes of my neighbors or my family, that notion is different. And so a person coming from Pakistan or Punjab or Afghanistan, their notion that a girl, a young girl, should be obedient, should not uh, indulge in sexual activities, or should seem to be uh, more destined in her clothes. So all these have been traditional values, and they've been there for a long time. Now suddenly coming to Canada uh, is, is quite different for them and very shocking. Um, and the nature of this violence, why women have felt, men have felt that women are their property, uh, with the sense of that we are the master, and if she does something that doesn't quite please us, that uh, we, you know, slapping, hitting was acceptable. And so violence, uh, and then many times if there was a suspicion uh, uh, of um, unfaithfulness, infidelity, and many men felt that she should be punished. I mean, our dramas are full of it. Mm -hmm. One of the great dramas written by Shakespeare is Othello, mm -hmm. written in 1604. That's 400 years ago. It is seen by every school kid in the, in the Western world. It is taught in every school. And what is Othello's story? Othello f is suspecting that his wife, Desdemona, is not faithful to him. Hmm? She is unfaithful to him, and that is engineered by one of the persons who wants to see them fight against each other. So, in order to now uh, teach her a lesson, he kills her. And it's only a little later he finds that, uh, that he's been duped. But when he says, why did I do it? And what would the world think of me, killing my wife? She says, well, I, they would say he was an honorable man. He did the right thing because she would have otherwise uh, done something similar or other women would have done something similar to their husbands. And, um, and so the notion of honor, shame, uh, within the family, uh, certainly uh, a family uh, in a very uh, well-connected tribal family. The notion is that a person should behave properly towards the strangers, towards uh, members of the family. And if you go really break those limits, you're, you're bringing shame. And you feel, uh, you feel as though you can't show your face to others. You can't walk with pride. You can't walk uh, with the full sense of, uh, uh, of uh, being an honorable member of the community. So these are these very deeply rooted. And this is not, I, I must con uh, stress again and again, it is not only for a Muslim community or Punjabi community. It is so in the English community and Scottish and the Irish and the Germans. Everywhere there is a notion what is right, what is not right. And now I can only uh, guess uh, as much or from what I can uh, read and so on. 
that a, a person of 55 years of age, 60 years of age, whatever, feels that his daughter of 14, 15, 16 is doing something that he has never thought would he ever permit would happen back home in India or Pakistan or Indonesia and doing this and so how to control it. And he has such a person and not only man, woman also, mother, grandmother, brother, sisters, they would feel how to control and there's certainly no support from the community. They feel as though if there's something the matter with you that you wish to control rather than what is being controlled. So uh, they feel, I think, it's a great deal of shame and, and shame with practical implications. What would happen to the other sister? How would they look at the other sister? Would she be marri marriageable? Eh? Could I, you know, feel? Eh, could I show my face in the community and say I'm a good man? And here's my second daughter who wants to uh, also uh, be to be married three, four, five years down the line. And um, would the others shun me? They will ostracize me. And would I be excommunicated from my uh, mosque or temple or gurdwara? Would I be treated as a good person or a bad person? So these are important things. Ki meri naak kat jayegi. I'll be spited. Um, and in a community which is really so well knit, a tribes, village where you, your world is only 200, 300 people you live in. That's your world. That's not 7 billion people, but those 200, million, uh, 200 people in a village, in a caste, in a subcaste, in a tribe. And if you can't walk with a, you know, a straight face with a, uh, in, in that community, then you say, oh my God, life is not worth living. Everybody laughs at me, they sneers me, they, they, they ostracize me. So these are very powerful forces. And, uh, and again, if I were to bring it in the Western context, the punishment that was most severe when we read, uh, uh, say, Greek literature 2,500 years ago, the drama, the most severe punishment you could inflict on anybody was to exile them. Um, for instance, in the Second World War, when France was occupied by the Nazis, uh, some of the French women took on uh, German lovers, uh, whether as prostitutes or as just chose to have lovers or, and so on. And when France was liberated, uh, these women were humiliated by the society. They felt that these, they have brought shame to the community. Their hair was shorn off and they were humiliated before the whole community because here the honor of a country was taken away by these women sleeping with Nazi soldiers. So from a clinician's point of view, do we even have the tools where we can make an assessment from, from an abuser's point of view as to what his or uh, his understandings are about what his religion says versus uh, uh, what his culture says versus to what extent would this person go to the level of killing this woman. So those are some, some key ideas, ideologies when we look at uh, making a difference between honor killing and between generally violence against women. it's hard to say how many cases have actually been prosecuted in the name of so-called honor crimes but there was a study which was released last year and which did speak to some of the data um, the person who did the study looked at uh, cases since 1954 uh, where honor um, crime or say honor was used as a motive uh, so uh, looking at that data I can say that um, the, the convictions have been anywhere from, say, a first-degree murder to an assault, um, and it's really, really hard to say uh, what has been the clear-cut verdict. That uh, law doesn't necessarily prevent victims because law is very reactive in nature. The enforcement, specifically, it's not proactive in nature. So they, the usually law will come and interact with the victims when the crime has already happened, right? So my opinion is that we need a lot more um, multi-sectoral kind of a approach to these kind of uh, issues. Um, domestic violence, violence in the name of 
so-called honor, uh, or any other form of domestic violence which is happening because of the, um, say, because of the gen intergenerational conflict and stuff like that, that needs a very complex, multi-sectoral approach. Violence against women takes place everywhere. It's in every country, it's in, ev it's in every geographical location, it's in every socio-economic status. But the question is, there are some places in this world where honor killing is much more intense, much more severe, and we need to understand what those geographic locations are, which areas they are, why that is so, so that we can make a comparative understanding. So there is an, uh, a responsibility on the, on the social workers or on the organizations to learn the cultural etiquettes, norms and traditions of other people so that they are able to make a reasonable and proper assessment of their victims. Not knowing about uh, another person's culture will put you in a diminishing uh, capability of making that assessment. So I think that the, these are some of the additional uh, uh, responsibilities that uh, mainstream service providers have in order for them to make a proper assessment of a victim. The service providers have to educate themselves about the culture, the religion of the groups that are visiting their centers. Okay. They need to understand that and um, uh, work with other organizations, um, uh, learn about the, the issues of the women and um, uh, the, the tools that they need to use when the women uh, walk into the center. The first thing they must understand is that they must have the patience to listen. Okay. And they also must have the skills to identify. Women will not always talk. Okay. Her mindset is that when she talks, there's a stigma. Who am I talking to? Is she going to take this information out in the, uh, into the community? Is my life in danger? Um, uh, would my husband find out? What if he does? Uh, what would happen to me? So uh, that sort of deep fear uh, is, is what uh, is a baggage that woman carries when she walks into the center. And the, the, the counselors, the workers, have to have skills to identify as the woman talks, the type of questions that she asks. For example, she will say, my friend is in trouble, what should we do? Okay, and that's a signal, you know, that's a clue that the worker needs to take and, and uh, start the conversation. We really need to truly raise the awareness of the social power within the social services um, sector. We really need to make understand all those service providers that they hold a lot of power in what they do. They might be doing this work individually, sometimes being very tired and being alone in the battle, but they collectively have an amazing, amazing social power which can impact institutional power, which can bring a social change. And that's the, the, that's the process and that's the journey we need to empower ourselves to be with, that I alone probably cannot make any change, but I along with 15,000 of other people who are working in the same sector with, to, towards the same issue, we can definitely bring a change. And that's what uh, social service providers need to understand. One of the things uh, what we would want to do is to have some uh, in-depth uh, discussion about their uh, family's understanding of culture and religion. What is the role of uh, culture and religion and how they are interpreting their religious uh, uh, values and their cultural values. The more we can find out under this domain from the victim, the more we will be able to make an assessment whether her life is in danger or not. So that's that's one thing that we would like to do. The second one we would want to find out is by asking her a series of questions around attitude. So what is the attitude of her male folks in the family? How do they view women? Uh, um, how strict are they? Um, uh, how how much uh, how much protective are they in terms of uh, have they threatened in the past? Uh, is has there been any? any uh, uh, historical uh, um, uh, evidence 
of uh, violence against them uh, or against their cousins or against somebody else within the, the family. So I think the attitudes within the family, if we uh, uh, ask a series of questions around it, we will be that much clo uh, closer in making an assessment about whether that family is likely to take severe actions against this young person or against this girl. The other one that we want to find out from this uh, young woman is how does uh, the uh, uh, family feel about her behavior? Do they feel shamed? Do they feel uh, 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 that the family is uh, becoming much more isolated? Do they feel that they have no place now because of her behavior? Uh, how are some of the practical reactions to her being an assertive young woman or, uh, or the one that uh, she is uh, an outgoing personality or dresses in a particular way or behaves in a particular manner? How upsetting is that? And if that is upsetting to this family, to what extent are they isolating themselves from the other crowd? And what kind of you know, attitudes are they displaying? So that would be another way to make a judgment in terms of uh, uh, making an assessment. The fourth one is that if the family comes from a known uh, area from back home where honor killings have taken place, uh, how is the family supporting that? Has there been discussion at home that yes, this is a common occurrence uh, where we come from uh, or this is the way life should be. Look how uh, uh, loosely or how morals are loose in Canada. Like what kind of discussion is taking place in a relationship when they compare Canada to the place back home? And especially if the place back home is where it has been known that uh, uh, honor killings have taken place. That would be another kind of you know, danger sign for us to sort of you know, evaluate further. Uh, the, 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 the fifth one would be how do we understand the integration of that family into the Canadian culture? Are they integrated? Do they feel that they are at a loss? Do they feel that they should never be integrated? Are they uh, feeling that somehow by coming to Canada, they have lost more rather than they gained some things? Uh, do they desperately want to preserve what, however they define their religion and cultural identity? I think that would give, that would be another way to sort of know, uh, find out exactly where they are in terms of their attitudes and, 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 and their. The other additional kind of you know, uh, 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 area which I would like to as a clinician concentrate on is to what extent have they threatened? Have they threatened just a little bit? Have they actually implied that if you do not stop this we are going to take some severe action to the extent of you no know, killing you? That this is un unthinkable? That this will never be tolerated by us? So those are, I think, if we look at these kind of uh, uh, danger signs, I think we will have a reasonable assessment made. How do we now make, a, make an assessment of protective this young woman versus not doing anything and allowing the circumstances to take over, which will eventually lead to her death? Rabindranath Tagore, he said, um, God, take uh, your wand and wipe out all those people who do injustice in this world. And then take the same wand and wipe out those who tolerate injustice. Okay. So these women need to understand that tolerating injustice is wrong as well. That is the approach that the organizations need to take. This is the time that we have to break that bondage of thousands of years and women need to, to come out um, uh, as, you know, as a fresh flower and, and uh, provide that beautiful pra fragrance in this world and say, yeah, she, she is a beautiful um, being and um, does not require bondage. If you take her, crush her, hold her, she will wilt and uh, 
and her spirit will die. Uh, a, a society where we really understand what human rights are. And at this moment, the difficulty we are encountering is that people are talking about, I have some cultural rights. And the moment you talk about cultural rights, well, many of the cultural rights violate human rights. Because cultural rights could be prejudiced, they could be biased, they could be reactionary in nature, but human rights defined by United Nations are very progressive. So when we say that human rights are fundamental, they are fundamental to both men and women equally. They are not, they, they, there is not, nothing cultural or religious about rights. Human rights are human rights, everybody has the right to life and dignity. Honor-based violence is just a symptom of a larger illness called patriarchy. 